Sometimes, in spite of your use of risk assessments and prevention techniques, patients develop pressure ulcers. Other times, patients are admitted who already have pressure ulcers. In either case, you need to assess and stage the ulcer properly. Pressure ulcers can be classified as partial thickness, when epidermal, dermal, or both types of tissue are damaged or destroyed, or as full thickness, when tissue destruction extends beyond the dermis. However, they also can be staged to identify the specific level of tissue involvement. The AHCPR Clinical Practice Guidelines describe four stages of pressure ulcer development. One way to show that you acted reasonably is to be familiar with the AHCPR guidelines on pressure ulcer staging. Another way to show that you acted reasonably is to provide care that reflects these guidelines. A stage one pressure ulcer displays non-blanchable erythema of intact skin. To detect this stage, use a gloved finger to apply slight pressure to the reddened area. Then release the pressure. A stage 1 ulcer will show a line of demarcation between areas of blanchable erythema and non-blanchable erythema. In a dark-skinned patient, you may need to rely on other indicators. For example, watch for shiny or taut skin, loss of natural wrinkles due to edema, changes in the skin's normal texture or character, and slight discoloration, induration, and warmth. A stage 2 pressure ulcer is superficial and characterized by loss of the epidermis, dermis, or both. It may look like an abrasion, shallow crater, or blister. Even though the epidermis remains intact in a blister, it's classified as a stage 2 pressure ulcer because the epidermis is separated from the dermis. An ulcer may progress rapidly from stage 1 to stage 2. For example, this ulcer has non-blanchable erythema with a slightly blistered area in the upper right. As soon as you see blistering, document the pressure ulcer as a stage 2 instead of a stage 1 and describe the erythema in the narrative section or check it on the flow sheet for pressure ulcer assessment. A stage 3 pressure ulcer shows full thickness skin loss with damage or necrosis extending to subcutaneous tissue. Adjacent tissue at the ulcer margin may show undermining. A stage 4 pressure ulcer demonstrates tissue damage or destruction through the subcutaneous tissue, fascia, muscle, and possibly the bone and supporting structures such as the tendons and joint capsule. The ulcer margin may have undermining and sinus tracts may be present. Stage 3 and 4 pressure ulcers are full thickness wounds. In them, blood vessels are destroyed along with dermal appendages such as hair follicles, sebaceous glands, and sweat glands. Three factors can make pressure ulcer staging confusing or difficult. These factors include wound depth, healing, and eschar formation. To stage ulcers accurately, Let's explore each factor separately, beginning with depth. Although you must measure and document a pressure ulcer's depth, remember that staging has to do with the level of tissue destruction, not measurable depth. A pressure ulcer's depth depends on its anatomical location and the condition of the wound base as it heals. For example, because this stage 4 pressure ulcer is on the elbow, where deep tissues are naturally closer to the surface, the ulcer may affect deep tissues without being very deep. This can also happen in the ankles, knees, and other locations where the peak of the bone is closer to the surface of the skin. During healing, the condition of the ulcer base affects its measurable depth, but not its stage as shiny pink or red granulation tissue forms across the wound bed the depth is reduced once granulation tissue fills in to the level of the epidermis document the depth as zero but keep the original stage designation an escar covered pressure ulcer can interfere with accurate staging according to the ahcpr guidelines when eschar or necrotic tissue covers a pressure ulcer, it must be removed before the ulcer is staged. 
This is because the tissue removal allows you to view the ulcer base and full extent of the tissue destruction. Why is this important? Suppose a necrotic pressure ulcer were documented as stage 3, but turned out to be stage 4 when the necrotic tissue was removed. This staging error would mistakenly suggest that the pressure ulcer had deteriorated. And if this error happened regularly, the facility would seem to have a problem with managing pressure ulcers. When documented, such errors would become part of the medical record, which could be reviewed by state surveyors and regulatory bodies, such as JCAHO. Therefore, staging errors could lead to citation for deficiencies, loss of accreditation and skilled nursing services, and reduction of the level of reimbursement. Once a pressure ulcer forms, you need to manage it properly. But to do this, you need to understand how it heals. Pressure ulcers don't heal by reverse staging. Rather, they heal in two distinct ways. In partial thickness wounds, such as stage 2 pressure ulcers, healing occurs by tissue regeneration, which is also called resurfacing or re-epithelialization. This healing takes place in three steps epithelial migration to cover the defect, cell division or mitosis to replace lost cells with new ones, and differentiation of a new epidermis. In full thickness pressure ulcers, healing occurs by tissue repair, which includes inflammation, cellular migration, proliferation of granulation tissue, wound contraction, resurfacing, collagen remodeling, and maturation. Be aware that a deep stage 2 ulcer will epithelialize like a superficial ulcer because they're both partial thickness ulcers. And the deep ulcer will granulate like a full thickness ulcer because it affects the dermis. It undergoes both types of healing, tissue regeneration and tissue repair, because unlike the epidermis, the dermis is vascular. When blood vessels are injured, connected tissue is synthesized, producing granulation tissue. This does not happen in a superficial stage 2 ulcer. Once a person proves that you owed a duty and breached it, it's relatively easy to prove the other components of negligence, causation and damages. Consider this case that occurred in Texas, for example, a few weeks after being admitted to a nursing home, an elderly woman developed an infected pressure ulcer on her lower back. Nursing home personnel assured her daughter that she was receiving proper care and her ulcer was improving. However, when the mother was taken to a hospital emergency room for an unrelated problem, it was discovered that the initial pressure ulcer had become a massive stage 4 ulcer and that three new ulcers had developed. When the family sued the nursing home for gross negligence, the party settled for $4 million. To reduce your liability exposure, stay current in your pressure ulcer care. Otherwise, you might find yourself defending your every move in court.